everyone and welcome back. With yet another round of models taking tumbles on the runway, I thought it was high time to talk about why modern high heels are so terrible. This is not a new thing. In fact, we've seen at least 30 years of models falling. There are so many videos and pictures of this phenomenon and it really makes you wonder why? Why do they keep falling? And sometimes you can attribute it to clothing got in the way, the surface was slippery, the lights were too bright, whatever it may be. But honestly, the heels have so much to do with every single situation. And if you've ever had any experience with high heels, you know that they are not to be trusted. They can be painful and downright dangerous. So I wanted to take today to talk about all of the things that you can look for in high heels that are going to be problems. And that should in turn help us explain all of those runway falls. Though most of my background is in historical shoemaking, I have a pretty good understanding of modern shoemaking as well. In fact, the reality is that shoemaking for high heels hasn't really changed much in over a hundred years. It's still the same general process and the same general materials, it's just that a lot of stuff has turned to plastic instead of some of the older formats. So the process really hasn't changed all that much, which I think points to the fact that we haven't really updated or upgraded our system in a century. That's probably not the best way to do things. I also have worked as a technical designer for a modern manufacturing shoe company for a number of years, so I understand how the system actually gets put into place and how easy it is for corners to be cut due to time or money and how quickly the effort to make something as comfortable and as safe as possible goes out the window. So let's first look at a standard high heel. You can see plenty of elements on the side silhouette, but there's a lot of stuff that you can't see going on on the inside. A good place to start with this is the shank. So this is what gives the high heel its permanent shape, and it runs all the way from the back of the heel down to under the ball of the foot. Most modern shanks are either steel or fiberglass, sometimes a combination of the two, and they will sometimes even have extensions that go so far as the tip of the toe. What this means is that the entire structure of the heel is very, very rigid. Keep in mind the fact that your feet are constantly flexing and moving. They are not rigid, no more so than any other joint in your body. They are going to flex as you walk and the shoe will not. So there's already inherently the beginnings of a problem here. In fact, one of the alternatives to the full length shank that we're used to seeing in most high heels is done for dance shoes where they end the shank before it reaches underneath the ball of the foot so that way the toe can still be pointed and flexed as need be in order to have easier movement. This is in part less popular for standard high heels because it allows the shoe to flex and change shape. And the ideal thing you want with your shoes, especially high heels, is for them to be stable in appearance, whether it's on the shelf, on a model, or on the actual foot. If the foot is flexing the shoe and it's constantly moving and changing, it's going to wrinkle and change shape, and it won't look quite as perfect as it otherwise would. So a lot of that does come down to making sure that it stays looking consistent. The shank also informs the curve of the arch. Now the entire shoe is built over a last, which is a shape that everything gets formed and curved over. So the shank will have to match the last curve on the bottom. This arch though can be widely varied in terms of its overall shape. You may have seen older shoes or even some modern shoes that have very curvy arches and others, most modern shoes in fact, are very straight. And this is because not everyone's foot has a very curvy arch. Some people are more flat footed than others. And if you don't put that arch in there, it can now accommodate everyone, theoretically. It just means that everyone can adjust the shoe to fit them. You will put some sort of extra cushioning in there. Some shoes do include that. There's a lot more memory foam and things like that inside of heels now. But in general, there's an expectation that you will make up that space yourself. This is important because the weight of your foot in a high heel can go entirely onto the ball of your foot. That is not what you want though. That is what's going to lead to your foot being very tired and sore very quickly. 
In fact, what you want is that the weight is distributed to your heel as well as the rest of your foot, no different than if you were standing barefoot on the ground. You're going to make contact with the ground in a lot more places on your foot. And so if your arch is properly supported, as we tend to say, it's going to actually be able to spread out some of your weight onto other parts of your foot. This is also really important when it comes to the heel because that's where you're making your impact and that's where naturally you'd put most of your weight. And if the entire thing is sloped straight down, there's nowhere for your heel to grip in. In fact, most feet, there's a different angle between the back of the heel and the arch of the foot, meaning that it'd be better if there was a little bit of a shelf. This brand in particular actually makes cushions that are supposed to fill that gap and flatten out that back heel space, evening out the weight distribution of your foot. So if you ever wonder why you put on a pair of heels and just slide to the front, that's part of it. There's nowhere for you to put any weight other than on the ball of your foot and that's going to lead to a lot of problems. This is exacerbated by not just the size of your foot, but by the proportions of your foot. So we can talk a lot about how models are being put into shoes that aren't necessarily their proper size. If they can fit their foot into that shoe, it's good enough, even if it's a full size larger than their actual feet. So they might end up in shoes that are a little bit more difficult to walk in for that reason. But even if the shoes are the same size as the models, there is a chance that proportions might not work. So just like our body can have different proportions, long legs versus short legs, our feet can too. So the two proportions that are really important are the back of the heel to the ball of the foot and the ball of the foot to the end of the toes. And those can vary pretty widely. So if you've ever put on a pair of shoes that was your correct size based on your total foot length, but you found that you slid really far forward, crammed your toes in and left a gap in the back, that's probably because that proportion means you have longer toes, so you'll slide forward to find where the ball of your foot needs to be, but the space for your toes is not proportionally long enough. So no matter what you try to do and push your foot around, it's not going to work. What you can do is add cushions to the base of the shoe under the ball of the foot that will raise up where that space is. You just have to make sure you have enough toe room. If your foot has the opposite issue and it's longer in back than in front, you might find that your arch feels wholly unsupported and where your foot actually comes down sits out from where the arch of the shoe is. This is where you need to pad out that arch more distinctly. The toe space issue is also a big problem in general. There are lots of different toe shapes, but not all of them are going to work for every single type of foot. We've all heard of the concept that a pointed toe doesn't really work for wider feet. Well, in part, this is because a lot of shoes are made with a very short pointed toe. This keeps the pointed toe from elongating the foot and making it look larger than it actually is. In fact, it makes it look longer and thinner, which doesn't necessarily make it look larger, but that is one of the misconceptions that reads into shoe design. In reality, the toe should extend off of the space that is already occupied by your foot with a round toe or a square toe or anything like that. So it should never take away from your toe space, no matter what type of shape the toe is, that doesn't mean that they designed it that way. Additionally, with the toe, we also want to double check for toe spring. This is that little lift at the very front that means that the toe is not actually sitting flat on the ground. This is how you can tell that the last and the heel match up correctly, that they were made for each other or partnered appropriately. If your heel is far too short, the toe spring will be way too high. Not only will it look really silly, but you'll be putting pressure on the ball of your foot further back than would be comfortable. And if the heel is too tall, you aren't actually meeting the ground width where your weight hits in the ball of your foot and you're instead putting the weight towards the tip of the toe, that's a big problem. Even if it's just straight across with no toe spring, especially with elongated toes, you might find that you have to walk a bit like you're wearing flippers. Because <laughs> as we walk, we lean forward and if the shoe is inflexible and has nowhere to go, you're going to need to lift your foot up way earlier in order to not just be pushing against a rigid toe space that has no give. So the toe spring kind of gives us a little bit of a runway in order to take off with our foot as we make our steps. This area underneath of the foot is also incredibly important from the other angle. So if you look from the front, you might notice that shoes are not always completely flat across the ground. A lot of times they sort of curve up on the sides slightly. This is because our feet do that and it's going to be unused space in the shoe and it will actually make the shoe look larger if we have to meet it all the way down to the ground. So a lot of times there's a little bit of curve up. If there is too much curve, however, 
that's where you won't actually be able to find the ground properly and you're just gonna wobble back and forth because you're walking on a domed surface. That is exactly what happened with this infamous model from last fall's Valentino show, where you can see from this really clear photograph how much of the shoe doesn't actually touch the ground under her foot. And you can see it from the side as well that the weight is sitting a little further forward than it should be. The tip of the toe is nearing the ground, whereas the ball of the foot is barely touching it, meaning that the part of the shoe that's hitting the ground in front is not the correct part and it doesn't have any stability. Add in the type of heel that she's got and there is no hope for her managing to keep those shoes stable. This is not only true with cheap shoes that are coming out of massive manufacturers, it's also going to be true of really high scale brands. They are going to sometimes choose aesthetics over function or comfort. And this is never more true than with stilettos. I'm pretty sure at this point, we all understand they are not the most comfortable or easy thing to walk in. They make so little contact with the ground that they are not going to prevent you from toppling side to side and twisting your ankle. Remember, as you're walking, the heel comes down first before the rest of your foot does. So there is a moment where you are balancing only on the tip of that heel. And the smaller it is, the less space you have to balance. And the more likely it is when the front of your foot comes down, it will be coming down at the right angle and will continue to rotate further than it should. So stilettos inherently are more likely to cause issues. But that's not the only style that there's a problem with. In fact, the current mode of shoe heels being much blockier, but extending flat off the back or even further back than your heel is also a big problem because as you step down on that heel and make contact for the first moment, there is a lot of pressure that occurs at that point. You are hitting the ground and that is going to radiate up your leg and you want to hit in the correct spot. That is not the back of your heel. You want it under your heel first. On top of that, if you're hitting that far back, you have a lot further to go for your foot to hit flat and nowhere to balance in between. So it's going to smack the ground a lot harder in front every single time. So there are uh, potential issues with that style as well. It is not necessarily more stable just because it is larger. It's also a matter of how it's balanced with the rest of the foot. This is also why it's so incredibly important that as the heel of the shoe hits the ground, the heel of your foot stays in place because if it shifts left or right, it's going to start taking the entire foot and inevitably the entire shoe with it because there's nothing to catch it before the rest of the foot hits the ground. This is where a lot of those models start their falls for many reasons. First off, the space for the heel of the foot might be incredibly large. This is definitely a constant problem in shoe manufacturing, especially when we're dealing with wider shoes. They like to widen out the entire last rather than just the front. So the heel space is now much larger than most people need. So if your heel can shift left to right, it can also shift up to down. Not only are you unstable, but you're also going to end up with blisters on the back of your foot. Generally, the way that they come compensate for this is by tightening in the top line of the shoe so that way it sort of pinches in near the top. This just simply means you have now an edge trying to hold your entire foot in place. It's going to be very painful and very ineffective. This is another place where I definitely recommend putting in a cushion if you have that problem. Not only can the entire heel cup be far too large and shift back and forth, but it might just simply be that there is nothing happening back there, that there is no upper to be seen in the heel area holding in place, or that it is so minimal across the back of the foot that it's relying on a simple tiny angle strap to hold the shoe onto the foot. Like I talked about before, your foot is very mobile. It's very flexible. It's going to move around a lot, even if that shoe doesn't and you need to strap in for the ride and that's where the uppers come in and that's one of the biggest problems with modern heels they are so often made up of nothing but tiny straps they are not substantial in any way they're not holding the foot to the shoe appropriately they allow for so much movement and a lot of those straps aren't adjustable. If you have one big strap across the ball of the foot, it doesn't adjust very well, especially when most of the shoes are no longer made out of leather for uppers, they're made out of plastic. Even vegan leather usually involves some level of PLU in it because the vegan leather options are not strong enough to withstand the lasting process and not flexible enough to deal with the day in and day out movement of the shoe and the foot. So they end up putting plastic in those to make them stronger and more flexible, but 
not nearly as flexible as leather is and not nearly as breathable as leather is. So you can end up with very stiff structures that don't have much give trying to hold your foot in that don't fit at all and have no adjustment. This is where a lot of the major problems really happen. No, a few little strings are not going to actually hold your foot in place. So if you are somebody who's worried about rolling your ankle, if you want to wear higher heels, but you want to wear them comfortably, look for something that has more coverage. The little bit of coverage that most of these shoes do have is incredibly, incredibly stiff, which also leads to the fact that as your foot starts to slide off of them, they aren't going to go with you. Both the toe cap and the heel cup are very stiff because again, we want to maintain the visual appearance of that shoe when it's literally not on a foot, just on the shelf. So it's better for it to be hardened to maintain its appearance than be soft and tighter to the foot and more flexible to the foot. I know there are more and more styles coming out nowadays that are knit or mesh that are lighter weight and more stretchy, which is wonderful. But if they're too stretchy, they're also not going to hold your foot into place. This is a great example of a mesh shoe that is not keeping the foot where it needs to be. And you know perfectly well that heel would easily slide off the side. So think about it from that aspect when you're looking at shoes. How is this actually going to hold to my foot? On top of that, if you've ever looked at a pair of shoes online and seen how beautiful they look on the model, and then you put them on your feet and it doesn't look like that at all, the ties are cutting in the straps or the opening at the top are causing your foot to squish out, it's because just like for clothing, we expect a certain body type for a model. We've come to understand that that's just the way the clothing industry works. They do the same thing for shoes. There are ideal foot models. They have narrow feet and they are particularly hard feet, meaning that they're not squishy, soft, and flexible. So when you're looking at these shoes being modeled, it's not necessarily what your foot is going to look like in them. And in fact, I even found these great examples of wide shoes being modeled by feet that were definitely not wide. So they're not going to look like that on your feet. You need to get to know your own feet and how they're going to interact with these shoes, particularly when it comes to the uppers and things like the arch shape. The thing is models never get to make those choices. They're being handed a pair of shoes that is hopefully in their size, often a little bit off. And these shoes are not always effectively designed. Not all of these shoes will actually make it to storefronts to be sold. Sometimes they are just for the runway. And so the concern over these things being incredibly comfortable to wear for a long period of time or stable to wear isn't something that they're taking into consideration. They're more concerned with the aesthetics of it. Even the ones that are making it to final production are very often putting aesthetics over function because they need to sell those shoes and they're happier to sell you more and more pairs until you find one that manages to work for you. So every single time you get a blister, a bruise, a bunion, any sort of problem with your feet because of your shoes, it's not your foot's fault. It's not your fault. There are things you can do to add cushioning inside, but in general, make sure you look for shoes that are going to be friendly to your feet because those little problems can become incredibly large problems for the rest of your body and for the rest of your life.